All right. Welcome, everyone. Good to be here with you today. My name is Ali Garrett. I'm a policy associate at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke University. Um, Nicholas Institute has been working with the South Carolina Energy Office on this initiative over the last year, and we're all really excited to be here with you today. Um, we can head over to the next slide. Awesome. So welcome. Um, just a few logistics before we get started. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be sent out to you all, all the attendees early next week. Um, we are a very large group today, so let's all keep our lines muted. Um, we won't do a lot of back and forth conversation in the large group setting, but we will have um, a breakout session towards the end today where we'll get to have substantial conversation on the recommendations. But in the large group, um, please use the chat function and send that to everyone for any questions, uh, clarifying questions, substantive questions, anything that you um, have coming to mind during the session today. Um, if you are able, um, please rename yourself to include your organizational affiliation. Um, and then if you're willing, we would love for folks to keep their cameras on today. We love seeing everyone and um, we would just appreciate that if you're able. So that's all for the logistics. We can go to the next slide. All right, so this is our agenda for the day. Um, we are going to do some welcome and overview for the first uh, 30 minutes or so, and that will serve as our kind of level setting for the day. Um, and then around 1.30, we will launch into the working group presentations. So you can see the order for those presentations um, right there. So equity and accessibility, public entities, charging infrastructure, incentives and financing, and then education, outreach, and workforce development. Um, so we will be together for about two hours before we head into our break. So just be sure to take care of yourself, step out as you need to, um, but do know that we will have a formal break around 3.10 today. Um, so I think, let's see, um, yeah. So after the break, we'll head into some breakout sessions. We'll provide the questions for those and that will be in them for about 30 minutes today. We have five breakout groups, so it'll be a fairly smaller group setting for us to all have some deep conversation. Um, again, just ask your questions in the chat. If you have questions about the agenda or anything else, go ahead and put that in the chat and we'll respond to you. Um, with that though, I will send it over to Nanette Edwards, the Executive Director at the South Carolina Office of uh, Regulatory Staff. Nanette. Well, thank you, Allie. And thank you to the Duke University Nic Nicholas Institute. Um, first off on behalf of ORS, I see we've got a large, uh, set of stakeholders that are participating today. I've heard that we had over 130 register. So thank you for your strong participation in this process. Um, it is very clear that the topic of EV is uh, a topic that is relevant to our state and the electrification of the transportation sector is a um, basically a topic of, of significance to many of the stakeholders on this call or on this Zoom uh, today. So how we got started, uh, the office regulatory staff appears before the Public Service Commission in a variety um, of cases. And I wanna say in the 2019 timeframe, this topic of EV uh, came up before the Public Service Commission. And it was through those discussions that we realized or through that case um, that we realized that that there needed to be more stakeholder input. And so turning to the South Carolina Energy Office, um, we looked for a way to facilitate those discussions. And of course, uh, we had worked with the Duke uh, University Nicholas Institute in a collaborative manner, uh, and they facilitated the energy efficiency roadmap. And so we turned to them and and, um, and we were very fortunate that they agreed to partner with um, the Energy Office again. And um, we've been very fortunate to have them facilitate this process. So uh, later today, as you saw, there's, there's five working groups. Um, there's a set of draft recommendations, and I'm gonna emphasize the word draft, that have resulted from the many months of work uh, reviewing the challenges as well as identifying opportunities. Um, I do want to take one note, uh, you know, the office regulatory staff, uh, the energy office is housed within the ORS. And um, these draft recommendations 
don't necessarily, number one, reflect full consensus of each working group. But number two, as ORS, we have a mandate to represent the public interest before the Public Service Commission. So I think sometimes folks may get confused and they may think that because ORS is part of this facilitation process through the energy office, that that means that we are advocating or uh, behind a particular position. And, and that's not necessarily true. In fact, um, you know, our job is to represent all customer classes, the concerns of all consumers before the PSC. And to the extent that there's issues such as um, who pays for what incentives, um, that is an issue that triggers our public interest mission before the PSC. Um, again, I do wanna emphasize that the recommendations are in draft form and that this is to solicit input and feedback from you, from all of you, um, that will then be used to develop the final report. Uh, I know I've said it maybe as many as three times before, but we could not do this without the support of the Duke University Nicholas Institute. Uh, as you can imagine, I think I mentioned there's 130 registrations just for today. There's um, 15 individuals that I believe have uh, been meeting monthly since January, and there's as many as 150 individuals that have been involved in some re respect with the working groups and they've been meeting and working since uh, February. So to orchestrate that level of uh, help, um, we just frankly couldn't do it without uh, the Duke University Nicholas Institute. And so a huge thanks to them, but also a huge thanks to each one of you. I know you gave up your time uh, to participate in this process and it's through you that this process um, moves forward for the state of South Carolina. And at the end of the day, that's what really matters, benefiting the overall state of South Carolina. And so on behalf of ORS, I just wanted to say thank you for all your time and effort. And with that, Allie, I'm turning it back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, Catherine, let's turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. And just one logistical issue. I think I've heard that there are a few people who are somehow inadvertently stuck in a breakout. I think we can try to get them back. <laughs> I'm sorry, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without some kind of technical difficulty. So thanks for bearing with us. I hope um, we've now um, rescued everyone from their from their uh, the breakout rooms. Um, yep, we're out of the breakout room. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Welcome sorry back. About sorry about that. <laughs> So um, thank you so much. And um, so my name is Catherine Reed. I am the Deputy Director of the Energy Office within the Office of Regulatory Staff. I do want to echo Nanette's thanks to everyone who's been participating. First of all, to everyone who's joined us today, but also to all of those who have been working so tirelessly with us since we began this initiative. Um, the purpose of my remarks today is to really build on Annette's remarks about sort of why we're doing this and how we got here and sort of an overview of the process we've taken. Um, but as Nanette mentioned, this is really showing the growing need for a broader statewide and comprehensive discussion and exploration of all the issues regarding electric vehicles and the electrification of transportation generally. Um, next slide, please. The, um, just, to re, just to revisit um, the objectives of this initiative, as we've stated from the, from the outset, was to examine the legislative and regulatory environment around electrification and um, identifying challenges and opportunities and to develop recommendations surrounding electric vehicle penetration and charging stations in South Carolina. So you'll hear, everything you'll hear today is really um, sort of um, those recommendations sort of summarized uh, for you all to provide feedback on. Um, so ultimately, the idea is to have a comprehensive understanding of the complexities of all the issues surrounding electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and to develop a strategic state, statewide approach to kind of have all this lead to that. Um, next slide, please. Just to revisit the timeline, um, many of you who are on this call have been with us throughout, um, and some of you might be new. So I just wanted really quick to say, this has been in the works for a while, as Nanette mentioned, 
2019 timeframe, we began discussing it. 2020, you know, the entire world was a little bit interrupted through COVID, as we all know. Um, but we got started at the end of 2020 with our with our core planning of this of this initiative. We kicked it off in February with our first workshop that many of you attended, and the idea for that was to introduce the topics and the, the issues surrounding electric vehicles, and then also to, to sort of develop a baseline understanding of the issues for everyone. So everybody kind of sort of level set. The second workshop, which happened in early March, identified the five sort of the five topic areas from which we developed working groups. Um, if you can advance to the, I'm sorry, one more thing I want to say. So you'll see where we are today um, at, the, at our October workshop. And then we'll, we'll, over the next many months, we'll be working on a, on a draft report to sort of uh, pull everything together. Um, next slide, please. So there have been basically three groups of participants throughout this process at various levels of involvement. So we always called it, our, our core team is what, who, who the people you see here on, uh, depicted on here. So um, in addition to me, Sarah Bazemore, our director, um, Stacey Washington, our senior energy specialist, and Ben Kessler, our clean transportation coordinator from the energy office. Um, I also wanna say though, we have recently also pulled in, this is kind of an all hands on deck, we've pulled in additional staff. So I do wanna recognize Rochelle Tolton, Rick Campana and Brian Kelly, um, and also Holly Ilea O'Quinn, who, who are all helping to make this happen today. Um, and then of course, as Nanette mentioned, the Duke University Nicholas Institute, they were such a fantastic partner throughout our energy efficiency roadmap process that we conducted back in 2020. Uh, we were thrilled to be able to work with them again. They have real skill and expertise in stakeholder facilitation, and we were thrilled to work under the guidance of, of Jen Weiss and Ali Garrett. I do wanna say Jen has just left us, so that's why you're not seeing her today. You know, I think she's in the audience. Um, hi, Jen. Um, but Jen has just been, um, she started a new position with the North Carolina Department of Transportation with an actual focus on electric vehicle um, issues. So she, she's now the senior advisor for climate change policy at the North Carolina Department of Transportation. We're sad that you left, but we're thrilled for you and thrilled for the state of North Carolina. Um, but, but Allie Garrett has been really just doing a fantastic job of, of leading this and picking up um, just making sure we didn't drop this ball. And um, I just wanted to, to say a special thanks to all of you. We've been talking regularly, and this is probably more, it's probably at least weekly, um, just to continue to move this process along. So, so we're the ones that kind of, you know, are responsible for the process, for all the meetings, for the structure. Next slide, please. So we also, early on, this was back in late 2020, early early 2021, we formed an energy efficiency, sorry, an energy electric vehicle advisory committee. Um, so basically the, the intent of this group was um, we, we strategic, strategically selected a, a group of people who broadly represented the, the, the breadth of stakeholder interest throughout our state. Unfor we did wanna keep it small. So that's why you're not seeing everyone represented on this, but the idea is we wanted every major interest a sector represented to the extent possible. And the role of this group has been to provide guidance throughout the process. Um, and they've been pretty much our sort of our thought leaders throughout the process. So we've been meeting on a monthly basis. Um, and you can see here, I just wanted to, you can see um, all the interests represented. Um, I do very wanna briefly wanna read everyone's name, Ben Johnson, Brent Ruiz, Dale Hill, Dietra Matthews and John Tynan, Heather Anderson, Heinz Kaiser, Jim Polk, Kevin Miller, Michael Frickson, Mike Jolly, Mike Smith, Ray Farmer, Rob Krulak, Stan Cross, Stephanie Mangini, Steve Davidson, and Tyg Howie. Um, each of these, these individuals has really stayed engaged, um, showed up at our meetings, and really tried to contribute to making this a process that was that was worthwhile. And if you the next slide, please. Also then, um, as I mentioned in the, at the March workshop last year, we identified what were the, t the, the major sort of buckets of topics that really rose to the top. And we identified five. Um, and so we formed working groups out of them. And uh, we have it on equity, accessibility, 
public entities, charging infrastructure, incentives and financing, and then education, outreach, and workforce development. I wanna give a special shout out, well, a couple of things. I wanna mention, first of all, when we say working groups, it, the emphasis is on working. We really demanded a great deal of these people. We're so grateful. Um, we're so grateful that they're still taking our calls, <laughs> um, especially our team leads. Um, I really wanna say, you all have been willing to share your, your time and your brain power and worked hard to identify the challenges and the opportunities to research solutions. And we even put them through this sort of arduous process, which I think was ultimately helpful, but it was arduous, which was sort of a scoring matrix. So we looked at all the different recommendations that we came up with and then tried to evaluate them, sort of try to be sort of um, sort of strategic and, and sort of try to quantify um, each of the, the recommendations. So I do want to thank the working groups for all they did. This, the, these, each of these little boxes represents a large group of people. Collectively, I think it was well over 100 people who've been actively involved on a more than monthly basis. And that includes homework. Um, real quick, the team leads, I'd like to recognize Deetra Matthews and Mike Smith, Michael Frickson and Ty Howie, Kevin Miller and Ben Johnson, Dan Cross, Rob Krulak, and Stephanie Mangini. So um, I do, and I want to really mention that there were several, each of these groups had members on it that were remarkably uh, generous with their time and really put a lot of thought and, and work into uh, making this a, a better product. And you'll hear from each of the working groups today and the recommendations that have resulted, and you'll see a lot of the work that went into it. Before I conclude, I also wanted to make another reference that, you know, I talk about these different groups, but one, um, one thing I do want to just give a shout out to is the ORS leadership. Um, Nanette Edwards and Don Hip have really provided a tremendous amount of guidance to us as we have navigated um, this process, and we're grateful to them. Uh, I also want to shout out to our communication staff here at Office of Regulatory Staff. Um, Landon Masters and Rad uh, Vaid are, have been really helpful in getting us, um, getting us so many resources that we need, including running the slide deck today and uh, beautifying our, our products and getting the word out. So I wanna make sure I recognize them. So before I hand it back to Ali, I wanna say, um, today is really about presenting the work that has been done so far, but also just getting feedback from those voices that we have not yet heard. So if you have not yet been able to participate much in any of this work, we welcome your feedback. And there'll be a variety of opportunities to do that, definitely through the chat, definitely through our breakouts later, and also with the follow-up questionnaire, which Sarah will, will mention. So I, I thank you all very much, and I'm going to hand it back to Allie. Thank you, Catherine. And Sarah, we'll go over to you next. You can advance the slide. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Baysmore, and I have the privilege and honor of serving as the director of the South Carolina Energy Office. Um, I came in in the beginning of June, end of May, so this stakeholder initiative was well underway, um, and I've got quite swept away with it and am excited to be here today. I wanted to give y'all um, a brief summary of Act 46 and make you aware of it if you weren't. This past year, thank you, Rad. Um, this past year, the General Assembly passed and Governor McMaster signed Act 46 to advance the electrification of the transportation sector, which is exactly what we've been talking about through this stakeholder initiative. But what it did was give us a greater forum um, for greater distribution and impact from the recommendations that bubble up from the stakeholders. I'll get into it a little bit more towards the end when I talk about next steps, but essentially the recommendations, as Catherine said, we will, um, that are not done today, these are not the final recommendations, but what comes from this process will go into a report. And that report will not just go on a shelf, that report will go to a joint legislative committee. And that joint legislative committee will then use that to help inform recommendations to the General Assembly. Next slide, please. As you can see, this is straight out of the act and it mimics the objectives that Catherine already highlighted for this stakeholder initiative. 
um, looking from both a legislative and regulatory standpoint um, through an environmental lens, an economic lens, and customer lens, uh, really identifying challenges and opportunities. And not only just the opportunities and challenges that are within the law or what you know may need to be adjusted to be able to make this um, advancement of transportation electrification uh, a, a reality, but also to identify challenges and opportunities in technologies. Uh, we are seeing so much happen right now in this sector, and it is really, really exciting to be a part of it. And finally, um, the, the goal set forth in Act 46 is to identify efforts to enable a more efficient and cost-effective transition to elect electric transportation. We, you know, have a lot of excitement, but we have to remember that a lot of times our innovation can come at a cost and we have to be careful and make sure we've balanced that cost both for um, you know, the public at large, but especially those um, that might not be uh, served as much by the electrification transportation. We wanna make sure that the impact as well as the benefit is balanced. And so I think we've been able to um, consider that Throughout all of our recommendations, we do have a working group. I believe we're starting with this one with the equity working group, but equity is not a consideration that is just in that group and their recommendations. It's a consideration that permeates through all of the work that we do and the, way, and the lens that we look through when we make these decisions. So with that, I say, let's get into it and hear these great things that the, um, that you, the stakeholders, and uh, those who've been working on it have been working on, and I look forward to hearing what comes from this day, With uh, especially if we have some new voices. Thank y'all for being here. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. Great, so we will jump right in. I'm gonna do some quick level setting on the process. If we can go to the next slide. So we will, and one slide after that, please. Um, so, we will have five presentations um, within this section with each presenter um, presenting four to seven recommendations each. Um, for each of those recommendations, the presenter will have about three minutes and then we'll have two minutes at the end of each working group to answer any clarifying questions. Um, so again, if you can please use the chat, put all of your questions and thoughts in there um, and then we'll try to pull out the clarifying ones to answer those in the large group setting because that will inform our breakout group conversations. Um, so we'll get deeper into that substance in the breakout rooms a little bit later today. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I just want to, as this has already been um, said so far, I just want to reiterate um, this slide deck includes a set of draft recommendations um, that we've developed since February 2021. Um, they're still in draft form, not, and they do not necessarily reflect full consensus of all the stakeholders. Um, and one of the reasons we're excited to be here today is your feedback and input, especially from those of you who have not yet been able to participate, um, will be able to go into and inform these recommendations, as well as anything you all provide um, in the follow-up questionnaire, which we'll provide at the end. So um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, first up, we have equity and accessibility. The co-leads of this group were uh, Deitra Matthews and Mike Smith. They're unable to attend today, but we have with us John Tynan and John Brooker, who will who are part of the working group, and they're going to be presenting to us today. So John and John, I will pass it over to you. Hey, thank you. Uh, thanks, Allie. I'll, uh, I'm John Tynan, Executive Director of Conservation Voters of South Carolina. I'll get us started, then about halfway through, we'll, we'll turn it over to John Brooker. Um, as Allie mentioned, uh, Mike Smith and Deitra Matthews were the leads for this group, and they shepherd, shepherded this whole group through a whole lot of discussion. Um, and Brooker and I, John Brooker and I, are going to do our best to pinch hit for them today. So, um, I think before we get going into the slides, as Sarah mentioned, um, equity and accessibility isn't something that can really be discussed in, in, in isolation. It, it can and should permeate throughout um, all of the policy recommendations, all of the proposals that are out there. So um, as we're going through this and as we're going through a number of the other uh, recommendations from the other groups that came up today, it's worth noting that um, the equity and accessibility team talked about a whole lot 
of issues. Um, we had a lot of recommendations that came up. Um, and what, what we did as they were going through those, identified where other groups were digging into those topics in a much more intense way. And so the equity and accessibility recommendations related to those were moved over to some of these other subgroups. So as the folks at ORS are working through what the final report looks like, there's going to be a way to flag, identify, and determine where some of these equity and accessibility recommendations um, are reflected and pop up throughout the report, not just you know, in one spot, because, because again, equity and accessibility should permeate throughout. Um, just as a flag, a couple of the places that you'll see uh, the equity and accessibility team where, where we transferred some of those recommendations. Um, there's a number of multifamily recommendations in each of the subgroups. We have one, but there's some um, other groups reflected multifamily as well. Uh, rebates and incentives for both vehicles um, and, and other uh, you know, e-transportation opportunities, both new and used. Uh, how you message uh, electric vehicles and electrification for different audiences, job training of EV fees and prices, pricing for charging, uh, rural infrastructure, and you know, there's probably a list of 15 other things that I could that I could mention. So, so you'll see uh, a number of these things pop up throughout. So that's kind of the high level, um, just kind of disclaimer of there's definitely going to be some things missing because they're probably reflected um, from an equity consideration in other recommendations. But I'm happy to go to the first slide, first set of recommendations in our deck. Um, the first one is um, ADA plus. Um, and the, the real top line around this is that um, as we were talking about accessibility, we looked at you know, ADA accessibility and really um, flagged that there should be some design considerations uh, related to EV charging stations uh, that uh, developing those design considerations and implementing them and potentially even looking at where those may go beyond just the requirements um, set by ADA. So we kind of shorthand started calling this ADA plus. Um, this would help to make sure that we have an equitable and dignified user experience for EV owners that may need to interact in a handicap accessible uh, way in the station. And so we're, the thought process is that it would apply to all state funded deployments of charging stations. Um, developing those standards is probably um, pretty feasible. Implementation, um, you know, implementation is where the rubber always meets the road. You know, obviously that will, um, you know, be something that, you know, various groups and individuals will look to, to hold the uh, local governments and other sites accountable. Uh, the next steps are, determining what exists um, at, both in South Carolina and beyond and um, you know, getting, the, getting that process and those conversations started. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So the next slide uh, talks about barriers to participation. Um, and this was a pretty meaty set of recommendations, um, really flagging that the, the public engagement and public participation process um, in South Carolina, not just around electrification, but around a number of things, leaves a lot to be desired in terms of getting a diversity of ge geography, income, um, you know, socioeconomic, uh, and, and racial uh, diversity representation into a lot of those discussions. So the summary um, here was, was to implement uh, enhanced community engagement and participation process. Um, and some of the things that were included in that that were too long to be listed on this slide were creating an interagency task force and ultimately a one-stop shop for EV engagement. So rather than having to comment to 15 different agencies, you're having one place where those recommendations would go to all those agencies. Also creating uh, a state registry of sorts where folks can say, I'm interested in learning more and being engaged in electrification conversations. And every time there's a decision point that gets pushed out to those individuals. 
Uh, and then uh, enhancing the notice, uh, public notice and um, public engagement opportunities um, so that we can make the meetings more accessible. You know, whether it's the time of day, where it's located, what technology is used to engage in any virtual ways, um, being uh, cognizant and aware of the varying kind of workloads and time of day needs and technology availability throughout the state. Ultimately, that set of packages was intended to reduce barriers and increase participation. Uh, you know, developing all of that conceptually is feasible, but how we implement it across multi-agencies, um, what funding might be needed to actually put those things in process. Uh, if legislation is required, that will take additional time. Um, and then next step would really figuring out how we take these concepts and actually put them in uh, very specific proposals and figure out if legislation or another pathway uh, is needed. There was a flag that the quicker we can move, the better uh, because of the anticipated EV infrastructure funding coming in the near term. Uh, next slide. And uh, the next uh, one for us was talking about batteries, resilience. Um, basically, the idea here was to support the funding for a pilot program that'll look at utilizing um, EV batteries for vehicle to grid um, and microgrid approaches uh, during power outages, particularly in you know, vulnerable communities. So the intended outcome is really to kind of proof of concept, you know, a pilot project to, to show that we can utilize um, vehicle to grid to provide that sustained power uh, in vulnerable communities, in particular during times of emergency. Um, the feasibility, you know, feasibility of doing a pilot project is, is, is relatively easy. All you need is funding and some partners. And so, you know, we had a, a more modest, um, proposal here is just to do that pilot project. And then as we see the results of that, as we learn from it and tweak it over time, the impact can be uh, relatively high on you know, citizens and communities throughout the state. So next step is basically getting that process going, determining which community or communities to work in, designing and implementing that site, evaluating the results and creating a larger program if successful. And next slide, and I'll turn the rest of these over to John Brooker. Hey, folks. My name is John Brooker, as Tyna just said, um, and I work for Conservation Builders of South Carolina. Happy to be here today talking to you about our equity and accessibility recommendations. Um, so moving forward, recommendation D is about e-bikes. This is kind of a, a broad view of electric vehicles, but this is something that came up as really important in our discussions. Um, the idea here is to establish incentives for increased adoption and usage of e-bikes. And in our discussions, you know, we kind of figured out that this is not only good for the first mile and last mile transportation, you know, kind of interfacing with transit, um, but also for folks that may might have, you know, three or four mile commutes that can utilize an e-bike for that. So the intended outcome of this recommendation is to create incentives like rebates for e-bikes or bike share programs. Um, moving on to the feasibility piece. Um, so um, it's fairly feasible. And the reason we think that is there's already a demonstration project in process um, and that appears feasible. Uh, I think Reverend Woodbury's group is focusing on that and is funded for that. Um, and then the rebate incentive could happen at the state, local utility or manufacturer level. And there's some other examples in other states for this type of incentive. And then uh, the next steps here are determining where a program would be housed, uh, forming partnerships around uh, making this happen, and then legislation if it happens at a state level. And we can go to the next slide. Perfect. Um, our next recommendation is EV education. Um, this is particularly focused on Title I schools. So the idea here is to establish a EV for schools program at Title I schools. And this would involve curriculum, a working charger, and 
a driver's education card. Um, the intended outcome here is education and implementation of EV infrastructure in low-income communities. Uh, basically just making sure that these communities aren't left behind or last as we transition to electric vehicles. Uh, feasibility of this recommendation. Uh, so there is already a solar for schools program um, that's fairly successful and we can just kind of follow that model here uh, where there's also potential federal funding that can help with this program implementation. So the next steps here are, you know, trying to figure out the best way that this program could exist in South Carolina, whether it's a utility, state agency or manufacturer program, you know, make those partnerships, you know, connect the curriculum and the, you know, get the charging infrastructure installed as well as um, provide the vehicles. So that is the EV education. Um, the next recommendation that we have is about health and noise considerations. And this is really about, it's, it's similar kind of to targeting, but this is ta targeting or prioritizing vehicle electrification in areas that are already disproportionately impacted by, I guess, traditional or fossil vehicle related health and noise impacts. Um, so it's really just trying to focus on those communities first, rather than making sure they're not left behind. So the intended outcome here is encouraging ve vehicle electrification of all classes in these areas through incentives and other policies, um, and then having this reduce healthcare costs and environmental burdens on these impacted communities. As far as feasibility goes for this recommendation, um, we thought that the first part is fairly feasible. We think that this data, uh, these data already exist, um, and that these maps and trying to identify kind of these areas to target for electrification will be fairly easy. It's just a matter of kind of assembling existing resources and data. Um, but, you know, legislated incentives um, and implementation may take some time. Uh, so then we kind of plotted out the near and medium and long term of this. So near term is, you know, identify that mapping um, and those areas with which to target vehicle electrification. Uh, these areas would have high vehicle related health and noise impacts. Um, in the medium term, that's the kind of the, the harder part is developing this incentive structures and policies that prioritize electrification in these areas. And then long term, which would be program adjustment and monitoring. Great, and then moving on to the next recommendation. Um, this is about low income multifamily units or housing. So the basic idea here is to establish policies and incentives to encourage EV readiness and the charging infrastructure itself at low wealth multi-unit dwellings. Once again, kind of making sure that these um, areas are, or these uh, types of facilities are not left behind as we transition to electric vehicles. The intended outcome here is to expand EV infrastructure and charging access in these multifamily units and um, try to determine the feasibility of EV infrastructure implementation at these existing new wealth and as well as new, or sorry, existing um, low wealth multi-unit dwellings as well as new dwellings. Uh, for the feasibility of this recommendation, um, some of that depends on the low income housing tax credit and whether EV charging is kind of eligible uh, um, under that program and who and how they are paying. Um, it also depends substantially on the types of housing. Um, there's a lot of uh, different types of housing and trying to figure out the right incentives for each of these. So incentives for existing public housing would need to be developed. Um, and then next steps here is, you know, really putting some heads together with South Carolina housing, public housing authorities and utilities to try to figure out the best path um, and figure out kind of what the best, you know, situation is with these different housing authorities and different housing types. So that's all I have here. And I'm happy to turn it over to the public entities group, but first I'll see if there's any questions that we can address. Yeah, so I'm, I'm taking a look at the chat. Um, 
Jennifer Renix had a question about whether the V2G pilot project is going to be targeted to a particular class of vehicles such as transit or school buses. And then Stacey Washington answered that in the chat, which you all can see that that's a, up for discussion. And they were talking about school buses initially, but are open to transit as well. Um, and then Donald put a question in here, um, which is a great point that e-bikes and electric are electric and pertinent to the current topic, but isn't the biggest barrier to their increased adoption more to do with road infrastructure and safety, um, an issue that they share with non-electrified vehicles. And uh, Michael Covington noted that those are concurrent goals. Um, so in terms of these substantive comments that we're getting, we're capturing those on sticky notes on our end for the energy office to be able to fully consider. And then um, we should speak to those again in the, in the breakout sec uh, sessions to have some deeper conversation. With that, uh, let's turn it over to public entities, um, Ty Cowie and Michael Frickson. Thank you, Allie. My name is Ty Cowie. I am the manager of the Office of State Fleet, and I am a co-lead for the public entities group with Michael Frickson, who's with the city of Greenville. Obviously, by our titles or what we do, our focus was on local and state government and the needs uh, we face and the challenges with EVs. So, with that, we'll jump right into our slides. Our first recommendation is a developing a needs assessment and educational campaign. Um, pretty basic stuff here, but uh, two components to the recommendation, a, the survey or assessment for all public entities statewide to determine needs and challenges, along with the development and implementation of an educational campaign so as to provide information to those agencies, cities, counties, all governmental entities. Uh, we would hope that the outcome would be to have a comprehensive understanding of all needs, uh, challenges faced by these groups, as well as uh, case types based on fleet type, or cases based on fleet types that we can provide information uh, and address those needs and challenges. Uh, highly feasible. Uh, can can be done and uh, is something we, we hope to get done. And then the next steps from that after the feasibility would be to engage that broad network of organizations that represent all public entities such as municipal association, county association of counties, uh, the Southeastern Governmental Fleet Management Association, uh, South Carolina Energy Managers, Regional Councils of Government, and many more. Uh, and then we'll pass these back and forth. I think Michael will do the next one. Yeah, thanks, Tyke. Uh, so the second recommendation from our public entities working group is to develop planning and zoning mechanisms to further the deployment of EV infrastructure here in South Carolina. So in a nutshell, this recommendation includes researching best practices and model codes and ordinances around EV infrastructure and then disseminating this information out to local governments and communities. As a bit of additional background information on this recommendation, uh, many jurisdictions are using outdated zoning codes that have only been updated probably in a piecemeal fashion over the years. And in many cases, the parking standards are largely the same as when they were originally put in place back in the 80s or the 90s. So that means that new shopping centers, apartment complexes, and parking garages being built today by and large do not contemplate evolving trends in transportation or commuting habits, much less anything with electric vehicles or charging infrastructure. So the lack of generally available EV infrastructure throughout a community is gonna foreseeably lead to a demand for government to take action, for example, by creating a statewide electric vehicle stakeholder task force. My notes have, have a little smiley face right there. Um, the truth is that governments cannot do this alone. And since charging typically occurs where a car is parked, as opposed to just swinging by a gas station, EV infrastructure will become a customary and kind of every, everywhere part of development as, as opposed to just you know gas stations in a commercial or industrial zoning district. So commercial and residential developers have a huge role to play in transportation moving forward. Uh, what the task force is proposing here is entirely feasible. Uh, resources exist that can provide us with best practices and assist with developing model policies. These recommendations would be advisory in nature, uh, and by that we mean uh, 
there are suggestions for local governments to consider. And ultimately it's up to local officials, uh, city and county councils to decide uh, what goes into their local development uh, regulations. Might add that a scaled or phased approach to this uh, might be helpful as well. Um, some governments may wish to require, for example, a certain ratio of charging spaces that go into new parking lots. Others might require that electric vehicle, uh, that the electrical infrastructure be included at the time of construction, but not the chargers themselves. Uh, some may want careful oversight for chargers installed in historic districts, and then just leave it at that. Um, others may want some basic standards in the event that a developer just acting on their own accord decides to install some chargers in a project. Um, we also expect and anticipate that a large number of communities will likely just stay out of this entirely and allow the private sector and the development community to steer this effort in their communities. One size does not and should not fit all, but helping communities understand the tools available to them and providing best practices will help uh, develop a comprehensive EV infrastructure network. So next steps, uh, task force recommends reviewing an existing guidance and resources that are already out there. Uh, it's important for EV advocates to engage with planning and development professionals, building officials, and the development community as they formulate these codes and ordinances in, in order to help build that buy-in and consensus. Um, once, these, once there's something to share, we can promote these uh, best practices and, and model ordinances through existing networks like the uh, South Carolina chapter of the American Planning Association, regional councils of governments, and others uh, to make available to their constituencies. So uh, move on to, oh, cool, it's already up here. <laughs> I'll go faster with this one, I promise. Um, recommendation three is to provide officials at public entities with decision support tools and resources to help them make informed decisions about electric vehicles and their fleets. This includes data from telematics and case studies along with various decision, decision support tools. Uh, for example, life cycle, life cycle calculators that enable comparison of electric vehicles to conventional fuel vehicles. Uh, in addition to helping public entities make informed decisions, it's also important to connect them to available funding opportunities. So these go hand in hand. The intended outcome here is to have decision makers at public entities have ready access to tools and data that will enable them to make thoroughly informed decisions, including the total cost of ownership, maintenance considerations and environmental impacts, and data from case studies and telematics will be essential to support efforts as they go after federal, state, and other funding. In terms of feasibility, we think that there is um, high, vis high feasibility, feasibility here, <laughs> excuse me. Um, there's several tools already out there that can be accessed for free and, and that are easy to use. Uh, the A Fleet tool came up as a regular part of our conversations for this working group. And next steps include targeting decision makers and financial or procurement teams at organizations that represent public entities. Uh, significant traction can be made by working through established networks such as the Municipal Association, the Association of Counties, Government Fleet Managers Association, Association of Energy Managers, Regional Councils of Government, and, and others. So uh, that concludes recommendation three. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Tyke for number four. Thank you, Michael. Um, you guys will probably be surprised to know we address ways to maybe pay for all of this or how might we pay for all of this. So uh, part of our next uh, recommendation D is to dig deep into the financial mechanisms that might help. We want to identify everything available to include cooperative purchase agreements, uh, the GSA program through state surplus, as well as uh, tax credit transfers. There's unique ways to do that that we've learned from other governmental entities outside of South Carolina and, and how can we help facilitate that. The intended outcome would be to have a total awareness and access to all mechanisms that would enable our agencies and our, our governments uh, to purchase EVs as well as charging equipment. Uh, the feasibility is high. There's plenty of resources available. There's already case studies uh, out there and, and creative minds that have come up with some of this, uh, but the resources need to be properly distilled and disseminated 
uh, to all relative uh, relevant public entities. And those next steps would be, you know, here we go again, um, kind of what we've seen at all the next steps is to engage the decision makers, the financial procurement teams and organizations that represent those same uh, public entity groups and associations and regional, regional councils of governments and others. And for the final slide, Michael, I'm coming back to you. Thanks again, Ty. Uh, so our final recommendation from uh, the public entities working group is basically to continue engaging with utilities. Uh, a lot of conversations have already been going on for some time in informal and formal capacities. Um, some of these concepts I'll emphasize are still in their inf infancy and the task force believes that there are opportunities in areas such as managed charging, freight structures, vehicle to grid, what we're calling vehicle to X opportunities. And by that, we mean um, vehicles providing a potential power source for a variety of applications. Um, again, a lot of this is still very early, but the potential we believe is, is quite exciting. Um, the intended outcome through this engagement is for public entities to receive a more comprehensive understanding of how EV deployment and charging will affect their rates and how bi-directional charging can provide benefits in terms of resilience, revenue, and others. We're optimistic about the feasibility of this recommendation, but given the complexity of utility rate issues, clear guidance could be difficult to come by. Um, the focus needs to include equity considerations as to who pays and who benefits. And we want to ensure that low and moderate income communities share in the benefits and aren't placed in a position of subsidizing others. Some potential pilot projects could be feasible if federal or state funding is obtained to support those pilot projects. As for next steps, uh, the task force recommends collaborating with utilities on rate structures and opportunities for a potential pilot project, especially if state or federal funding for, like we said, that pilot project comes available. Um, so that's a wrap for the public entities working group and our recommendations. Just wanna say thanks again to TIG, um, the energy office staff and all of our working group members who participated in our many discussions over the last several months. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael and Tig. That's great. Um, I don't see any anything in the chat. Um, so I am gonna go ahead and hand it over to the charging infrastructure group, um, which is Kevin Miller and Ben Johnson. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if we can go on and advance it to our, our first recommendation. All right, so recommendation A, and this one, this one is fairly broad, um, but our, our first is to deploy electric vehicle supply equipment infrastructure along freight tourism and evacuation routes through the collaboration of multiple state agencies to facilitate economic development and growth throughout South Carolina. This will encourage plan and collaboration across public and private efforts. Um, we do want to make sure that um, you know, we're able to deploy equipment at, at open standards and that it is able to, to grow and to be scalable as um, new technology emerges. So the intended outcome is to provide the ability of multiple agencies to determine where to deploy electric vehicle supply equipment infrastructure that's future-proofed, scalable, and planned across stakeholders to maximize utilization and the impact of this infrastructure to the economic development and well being of South Carolina's businesses and citizens. We do believe that this is a very feasible recommendation uh, with the anticipated federal funding. And although currently there is no state funding that exists uh, to develop these corridors that would facilitate economic development. And so the next steps are with the federal investment, uh, this recommendation can be accomplished within the next five years. And of course, any additional state money would accelerate this process. Okay, great. Um, I will go on to the next recommendation, which would be to expand the existing state alternative fuel infrastructure tax credit uh, to be eligible for uh, electric 
vehicle charging systems as well. Um, if you're not already familiar, there's an income tax credit for 25% of the cost to purchase, construct, and install alternative fuel infrastructure. Uh, but the definition of alt fuels infrastructure right now in South Carolina uh, is uh, limited to um, a set of fuels that does not include electricity. Uh, so the purpose here would be to expand uh, that definition to uh, be inclusive uh, in a technology neutral manner to also support electricity. Um, this could be a valuable, flexible, and sort of use case agnostic uh, incentive uh, to uh, incentivize more investments uh, in folks who want to provide charging as an amenity or fleet operators, um, it could really apply to uh, any number of use cases anywhere someone might uh, plug in. Um, in terms of feasibility, uh, as with any uh, legislative feat, sometimes it's uh, hard, sometimes it's easy. It would require uh, some process and engagement. Um, given that there is an existing incentive, uh, increasing uh, its um, scope to also uh, include electric vehicles is uh, something that uh, it would be, I, uh, I imagine, uh, broadly supportive. And there are good examples, uh, including the federal infrastructure tax credit, which is uh, all fuels vehicle um, agnostic, uh, to a point in the direction of uh, why that would be a, a good approach. Uh, there uh, is an opportunity here for uh, participants uh, and individual members to um, advocate for, for this uh, expansion, and it's one that uh, we're uh, hoping uh, folks would be able to dive in on uh, after uh, the conclusion of these processes. For the next step, uh, we touched on this briefly in the uh, similar themes in the prior group, looking at um, zoning and building codes, uh, all types of issues exist that currently present barriers to the uh, provision of electric vehicle charging for residents who don't have dedicated overnight parking. So folks who live in multi-unit dwellings uh, or uh, otherwise may have limited access to uh, dedicated parking, um, having this benefit uh, is uh, incredibly important as, as of right now, uh, 80 to 90% of all charging takes place uh, at home. So there's no one size fits all approach to uh, fixing um, that issue and to meeting that gap. Uh, there are examples uh, around uh, the country that, that we can point to um, touching from uh, building codes to ensuring that folks are not unreasonably restricted from installing charging at uh, their own multifamily home, which is sometimes referred to as right to charge, um, or ensuring that if there are uh, public investments or other public facing investments uh, that some funds be earmarked, for example, 40% of funds for uh, disadvantaged uh, communities consistent with the Justice 40 initiative. So again, the, the outcome here is to ensure equitable widespread access uh, to charging uh, at the place where it's uh, most convenient and the place where it creates the greatest possibility for widespread grid benefits, uh, long-term overnight uh, charging so that you can wake up every morning and have a full uh, battery. Um, it is a, a feasible uh, issue to uh, tackle in the sense that it's one that uh, there's a lot of buy-in for in general. However, things can be uh, thorny uh, in terms of multi-agency uh, jurisdictional overlap, as well as some things that may not be within a direct control of, of, of any one given stakeholder. So um, having uh, some uh, uh, multi-pronged engagement uh, between agencies, uh, public service commission, uh, public utilities, um, independent operators to align incentives uh, to limit those barriers to installing uh, long-term charging for uh, folks who uh, don't have dedicated parking um, is, uh, is gonna be a critical next step. And that can also include creating specific guidance for um, policies and programs uh, with that in mind to ensure that uh, that access to uh, residential charging is available, whether you have uh, the white picket fence and uh, a 2.2 kids or not. So this next piece uh, relates to uh, the creation and establishment of sort of rules of thumb, voluntary sort of minimum standards. Uh, for uh, everything related to uh, the deployment, installation, and operation of electric vehicle charging stations. Um, 
under the um, umbrella of the Plugin South Carolina marketing campaign, uh, there would be um, assets that are made available uh, to make it easier for uh, new participants in a distributed electric vehicle charging fuel system to participate, whether they are an experienced uh, provider of uh, electric vehicle charging or whether they're a new grocery store that's looking to provide an amenity or a new uh, or existing multifamily uh, residents uh, looking to understand uh, what comes along with charging, what they should think uh, to expect. And um, by creating these voluntary minimum standards and having a convening and a dialogue around what folks can and should expect, uh, that can help ensure increased access uh, to uh, equipment, uh, ensure uh, key safety and cybersecurity uh, features are in place that folks are able to uh, access charging um, no matter uh, how they want to pay and uh, guarantee uh, a certain level of consumer protection and ensure that folks have an idea of you know, how they could redress any concerns they have. Uh, this, uh, because it is far reaching, will require uh, all types of coordination between uh, private industry to ensure that um, the recommendations that be included here are consistent uh, with uh, what's uh, available, possible, feasible, uh, and um, that there is uh, no um, no piece left behind. Uh, for example, you know, if you're touching on consumer protection, making sure that we've got all the right state agencies involved to ensure um, you know, the accuracy of charging stations from a weights and measures perspective, there's a, a lot of details to dive into. Um, so uh, looking at what other states have already either implemented themselves or what types of guidance they've made available could serve as a good uh, framework and uh, convening more discussions uh, with the industry um, as state plans and uh, paths forward get set uh, to have these resources available to make it easier for folks to decide to install and offer charging. Appreciate that, Kevin. And I'll take on this one, Recommendation E, Statewide Electrification Roadmap. So uh, this recommendation came out of a lot of conversations within the infrastructure group that we realized that a lot of state agencies are going to have to be involved in this transition toward electrification. Um, and so this recommendation seeks to develop uh, transportation electrification by setting and promoting goals of South Carolina to attract the automotive industry, tourism, and economic development. Um, the intent is to provide guidance to agencies. Certainly at this point in time, all the agencies kind of realize that we need to be all hands on deck for electrification, but um, it's not exactly within our, our you know, guiding documents or principles. So um, this would aim to set uh, levels of involvements for state agencies, not limited to our own at the Energy Office and ORS, but certainly within Commerce, Agriculture, Department of Revenue, Department of Transportation, our Health and Environmental Control Agency, and the Fire Marshal for Codes and, and Permitting. Um, this recommendation would require legislative action to be feasible, so certainly uh, this would be a legislative action um, and would require on input from stakeholder participants. Um, but the hope would be to set kind of a level playing ground for our agencies to move forward all together collectively toward electrification. Um, and I think we have one more that Kevin you'll you'll do and I'll uh, tie up in a nice bow on the end. All right, great. And th this is um, a recommendation related to uh, essentially what are the ways in which we can ensure uh, robust participation and partnership and alignment with what our uh, partners in the uh, utility industry are doing with what uh, folks who are providing charging are doing and, and how the uh, public sector can best support that. So um, there uh, is often broad discussion around this and it has come up in, in the other working groups. Uh, and the key purpose here is to, to develop an industry committee that can uh, facilitate a better, clearer understanding of uh, existing and uh, best practices in, in utility uh, electric vehicle programs, uh, the ways that electricity rates themselves uh, are designed and how that can ensure uh, the appropriate and effective uh, use of uh, EV charging as a grid benefit, as well as ensuring that rates um, do not inadvertently disincentivize uh, private investment in EV charging. And also um, to, again, encourage those smart charging behaviors. So there's a lot of perspectives that'll uh, have to uh, be taken into account here. And by bringing those folks together, the outcome that we'll see is, uh, is gonna be a net positive towards those goals, bringing in fleets, um, OEMs, uh, vehicle side on the infrastructure side, 
uh, utilities themselves, uh, other uh, public entity uh, perspectives uh, to share uh, insights and to, uh, again, point to existing best practices and, and what we can learn from that in South Carolina. Um, the recommendation itself is quite feasible, uh, uh, provided that folks uh, are able to make the time in our busy, uh, busy lives nowadays, but this would just require, um, you know, commitment and participation uh, to uh, continue those uh, dialogues and get even further in the weeds than, than we were able to do uh, in our working groups. Um, and uh, as a next step, uh, um, the South Carolina Manufacturing Council and, and Automotive Councils are going to be developing uh, an industry group uh, to do so in a spin-off manner, uh, which will help to, to convene and, and serve as a venue there. And, and before you tie a bow, Ben, I just want to briefly note that as, as uh, flattering as it was uh, to be recognized for uh, participation among, and I know all the other uh, team leads would agree that uh, critically important, none of those uh, efforts would be possible without all the hard work of the, the EV core team uh, who gave us you know, the, uh, the venue and the, the freedom to, to come up with pie in the sky ideas, as well as uh, having those in the weeds discussion. So uh, I'll let you tie a bow on it, but just wanted to make sure that uh, we showered some appreciation back your way because uh, uh, y'all did uh, yeoman's work. I really appreciate that, Kevin, and, and thank you for your kind words. And, and certainly, like Kevin said, uh, you know, this recommendation will be uh, part of an effort that the Automotive Council will be doing. And so you'll see when we get to the education, outreach, and workforce development uh, recommendations that this will be merging with recommendation A, which is to develop a statewide committee. So you'll learn a little bit more about that um, coming up. But certainly, I just wanted to give a little pause and say, you know, we ran through um, corridors, multi-unit dwelling, uh, tax incentive, utility program design, and um, a statewide roadmap. So um, are there any questions or discussions about any of the infrastructure uh, recommendations? And we're, we're a little bit ahead on time, which is great. So folks can feel free to unmute themselves and ask those questions now if you'd like. I'll also open it up for anything related to public entities or equity and accessibility since we're a little bit more than halfway through. <clears throat> well, bar none, I just want to say uh, thank you to all those involved in the infrastructure group. I know that that was one of our largest working groups. And certainly, uh, like Kevin said, we went all the way down into the weeds and also all the way up to 50,000 feet in the air. So uh, really appreciate all those conversations and um, all the, the relationships we made there. So thank you. all. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Um, and thank you, Ben and Kevin as well. Great. Uh, stay on cross. Let's turn it over to you for incentives and financing. Great. Thanks, Allie. I hope everybody is standing up and stretching out and uh, staying hydrated as we dive into the second half of today's meeting. So the finance and uh, incentives and financing group started off our work kind of thinking big picture about all the different ways in which, uh, you know, moving our transportation sector to electrification could be advanced and enhanced by, you know, effective incentives and, and financing opportunities. And through that conversation and through a number of, of exercises, we, we began to hone in on sort of these four recommendations that you see in the slide deck today. Um, and so these four recommendations are, are I just want to be clear that they came from, I don't know, maybe 50 different ideas, right? And then kind of bringing them into focus and, and seeing how those sort of initial ideas were related to one another. Um, and what that exercise uh, did for the group was to get us to think about incentives and financing in kind of these, these four key ways. Um, you know, one being, you know, how do we help consumers transition? Another being, how do we help fleets transition? Then along that line, how do we make sure that consumers and fleets 
have accessibility to uh, EVs if they're available across the light, medium, and heavy duty sector. And then recognizing that utilities play a critical role in this transition, how do we incentivize that in appropriate engagement to move it all forward? So I'll walk us through these recommendations on a really high level. You all can, can obviously you know, read what's here on this slide. Um, so let me just start with, with recommendation A. When we're thinking about consumers, obviously we're thinking about the upfront cost of electric vehicles currently being higher than internal combustion vehicles. Um, but we're also thinking about the fact that along with that higher cost, is there some perceived risk from the consumer perspective? You're buying into a new technology. Uh, there's concerns about um, how ready for big time that technology may be. There's concerns about uh, you know, limitations in lifestyle uh, because of a reduced range, challenges understanding infrastructure. So from a consumer perspective, we all know that it's, it is a challenge to move from what you're used to, driving a gas car and truck, to driving something new. And so any financial barrier uh, to that process when we're looking at, you know, beyond early adopters who are eager to jump into new technology and we're looking more towards that mass market adoption, any financial barrier is going to be significant given all those other challenges that consumers are grappling with when they're thinking about moving to an electric vehicle. So that was kind of the mindset by which we brought um, you know, this, this recommendation forward. And when we're thinking about you know, incentives, you know, what we're looking for in the outcome here is you know, by all means that whatever incentives are put in place facilitate equitable accessibility to electric vehicle ownership. Um, and that's really important because there are some incentives that, you know, like uh, tax credits, for instance, that might alone look uh, compelling, but when you really start looking at who could take advantage of those tax credits, depending on how they're structured, um, you start to realize that, you know, many of the targets that you might be going after don't have enough tax liability to take advantage of them. So it's important to not only think about mechanisms, but to really think deeply about how those mechanisms can be best set up to ensure that equitable accessibility. Um, and that's why you see us speaking a little bit in you know, potential outcomes of kind of looking at you know, the difference between tax credits and, and on the hood rebates um, as different ways to stimulate kind of that mass market adoption. With everything under finance and in financing and incentives, the feasibility is there, without a doubt. There are examples of everything that we're talking about in these recommendations happening elsewhere in the country. But anytime we're talking about money, opening up money, accessing money, getting money to flow, uh, you know, there's challenge, without a doubt. And so for every one of these recommendations, we recognize that there's a lift that will need to happen in the, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, education outreach to decision makers, working with regulators, you know, just really helping to ensure that everyone along the decision-making tree understands, you know, the ultimate outcome of these uh, recommendations and the benefit back to South Carolinians, uh, to the environment and to the state's economy as a whole. You can go on to the next slide, Allie. So when we move to fleets, um, you know, the incentives and, and financing needs and opportunities shift. Um, you know, some of the same mechanisms may be in place. You might still be talking about um, rebates or tax credits uh, or, uh, or sort of creative financing mechanisms that can enable fleets to deal with, you know, two key barriers to adoption. One being, again, the current additional cost of electric vehicles compared to the internal combustion vehicles they'd be replacing, but also the added cost of charging infrastructure um, that has to go along with a purchase of those fleet vehicles. And so for the, on the fleet side, um, you know, we're going to be looking at um, mechanisms that are being used uh, across the country to, to help deal with those two issues. And that can include engagement with utilities and really creative 
rate design and programs that can help um, you know, take away the challenge of the cost of infrastructure as well as operation and, and of that infrastructure. And also looking at um, different types of, of financing mechanisms um, that can be brought to bear to help support um, this fleet transition, both for public and private. And one thing to note with, the, with fleet electrification, we also had a number of conversations kind of differentiating between public and private fleets that when we're thinking about state action, there's a different set of cascading benefits that come from electrifying vehicles that the state owns and operates, um, where a lot of the savings uh, on a total cost of ownership basis would be coming back to the state versus um, how incentives and financing might pencil out on the private side, where those direct savings would not be coming back to um, state coffers per se, but where they would be helping to drive broader economic um, development and growth across the state. Next slide, Ali. So Reclamation C kind of gets at this availability piece. Um, and, you know, you see in the summary that, you know, the real kind of this, this sort of gets laser focused now on kind of that light duty passenger EV space. So this is the, the market where, you know, we're seeing, you know, the, the greatest degree of activity. It's kind of the most, the, the most mature sector of um, the EV market to date. And what we're recognizing is that automakers are making a, a lot of pledges to shift from a trunk combustion engine production to electric vehicles. And, you know, we can, you know, looking at the forecast and where the market's likely to go, we can all see that there's going to be an abundance of electric vehicles available for sale. What's more challenging to see is, is that where those vehicles are available, where they're showing up on dealer lots, varies tremendously state by state. Um, and states that are more favorable um, for automakers to sell EVs or states that have some type of standards or regulations that um, require automakers to pay more attention to those markets tend to have more of those electric vehicles on their lots. And what that can look like is that, you know, if you go to a, a lot in a state that's not being prioritized, a dealership in a state that's not being prioritized by electric vehicle manufacturers, you might have one, two, three EVs on the lot. They might all be the same trim level. They might all be the same color. That's the choice you got. You go to states where automakers are prioritizing the sale of electric vehicles, and that changes. You might have 50 EVs on the lot representing all trim levels and a dozen different colors. And so from a consumer perspective, if you don't have availability, you don't have choice. If you don't have choice, it sort of winds up leaving consumers uh, you know, kind of deprived of the opportunity to transition to electric vehicles. And so this recommendation is recognizing that and recognizing that even as automakers ramp up electric vehicle production over the next three to five years, um, that production is going to be you know, slow and the vehicles that are coming off the line are gonna go to where you know, the market's most conducive for those automakers. So we wanna make sure that South Carolina is one of those locations. Um, and so you know, this recommendation has a lot of different kind of policy uh, mechanisms that could be levered uh, to move the state in that direction. And it'll take analysis and a lot of conversation to understand, you know, which are the, the right policy levers for the state, what sequencing might make the most sense. But at the end of the day, you know, this recommendation is all about making sure South Carolinians aren't left behind um, as we transition to an electric vehicle future. Next slide, please, Ali. Right, and our final recommendation is recognizing, you know, the importance of utility engagement as a catalyst um, for this transition. And now we're talking back, you know, light, medium, and heavy duty. We're talking about consumer adoption. We're talking about fleet adoption, both public and private. In all situations, you know, the utility plays a, a key role um, given the assets and capabilities that, um, that they possess. And so, you know, this outcome is looking at, you know, how to appropriately engage the investor-owned utilities, municipal-owned utilities, the electric member co-ops, 
in order to make sure that electric vehicle charging is ubiquitous, accessible you know, to all, but also that the charging infrastructure is being deployed in a way that at the end of the day supports driver's needs, fleet's needs, and supports the grid um, uh, and, 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 and sort of grid function. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's overlap with this um, and what we heard in the infrastructure group. There's overlap with this and what we heard in the equity group. Um, but this is gonna be an area of a really important focus for, for making sure that you know, South Carolina takes advantage of this really unique position the state's in, which is to be a little late to the game, which allows the state to look at everything other people have done and see what's worked effectively and what hasn't, and really cherry pick those best practices when it comes to utility engagement and consider how um, engagement can help move the market and ensure the long-term resilience of uh, electric vehicle charging and, and grid functionality. So I'll go ahead and leave it there. And if, if folks have any questions, happy to entertain them or we can wait till breakout session. Yeah, we can. Um, we're still a little bit ahead of time. So um, I would like to direct folks to the chat, just look at what's going on there. And then if it's anything folks want to bring up in the large group, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and do that now. All righty. Um, we'll give one more opportunity right after this last presentation to, if folks want to speak up in the large group. Um, if not, please just keep your thing, keep everything coming in the chat. This is great. Um, good. So thank you, Stan. And we will head over to education, outreach, and workforce development now. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Rob. Okay, Allie. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Thumbs up. Yep. Okay. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Krulak. I am uh, based uh, at CUI CAR, the Clemson University International Center for Automotive Research. And um, my specific role is really working with the industry and strategic corporate partners. So this is a lot of what we get the opportunity to discuss on a daily basis. So I'm very pleased to be part of this team and the outreach. I um, also wanna thank Stephanie Mangini from Volvo for being a very significant co-lead along with other, all the other members of our um, education and outreach group. So we'll start off basically with um, recommendation A, um, but just to really wanna mention before we even get into the recommendations around uh, education and outreach that it's, it's everything we see in terms of the headlines is really all around the vehicle and the OEMs. Um, so when we did the education and outreach side, we had to really take a step back and take a look at the entire ecosystem and the verticals um, that are players in this. And some of those were just recently mentioned. So obviously we know there's the consumer piece. We know there's the fleet managers and asset management for operation, um, the EV sharing type companies. And then there's obviously technology and safety. And then of course there's the education and the training entities. But really what that is, is a very nice broad spectrum that covers everything for us and a big opportunity for us to play with regards for everything from research and development all the way through the end of life. So as we talk about the um, recommendations from this group, we are really not taking a look at just the OEM or just the vehicle entity itself. So if we can just kind of keep those as mine as we go through, I, th I think that'll be helpful. So taking a look at uh, here, starting out with recommendation A, um, we're really talking about how to, how to provide a statewide committee to help further facilitate outreach, really create awareness and education around all things EV. Um, and then also work, how do we house this? So we're, we're fortunate enough that we have the Autom South Carolina Automotive Council. That's already part of the state and has been very active. They have been willing with open arms to kind of embrace this and, and bring this and house this type of committee within their group. And then we will take a look at everything from the from the uh, all EV space within the networks. So how do we improve coordination on this? Um, this is really um, a room for 
for multiple engagements from all levels. Um, we won't stop with just this committee. And as it was mentioned earlier, this is just the draft. So the next steps are really to develop a plan to utilize the, the current infrastructure that we have and to expand it and also to reach out with, within the Automotive Council and move it forward. So um, additional participation and voice is certainly welcome. And moving on to recommendation B, um, this is really around developing and funding a workforce development plan just around um, e-mobility. So we noticed that e-bikes came up earlier. There's going to be other forms of e-mobility around the shared economy, as well as the one-to-one -one consumer and, of course, the fleets. So we also need to um, have an opportunity to, to conduct asset mapping around what that looks like um, for each of those entities and how they function and how they leverage and how do we utilize um, the assets and the knowledge base that we have. So the key thing in there is again, is within the subsystems um, of all these different entities in the, in the vehicles and how we provide the service networks back. So again, we talk about fleet optimization, obviously the larger companies are gonna have um, very leveraged assets to, to manage that. They're small and medium fleets that if we can provide the right resource and education tools to them, they'll have the opportunities for, for success and business growth as well. Um, in terms of the barriers, it's really just pilots um, to get these established. And then how do we just create a really collaborative um, opportunity and, and workforce to support a lot of this. The education piece for us, um, because not a lot of the vehicle design and development is being done in the state, uh, maybe at least from the consumer side, but more so from maybe people moving side. Um, R&D is there, um, but in terms of the workforce, everybody has workforce needs and challenges, which is a lot of what we talk about today. So how do we really provide the workforce um, for everything from from also the R&D piece all the way through end of life. And that's the opportunity that exists. So I think funding, programmatic ties, programmatic challenges uh, is also the opportunity in terms of which there's needs for additional um, growth and communication on it. Okay, Ali, we're gonna move on to recommendation C. Um, we've kind of addressed a little bit here. Um, what we wanna do is have brand agnostic campaign. So uh, while we are all aware of one particular EV manufacturer that uses its own vehicle charging system, we believe that the Society of Automotive Engineering is looking at how to include charging for brand agnostic capabilities. So that will obviously present opportunities for the EV space um, beyond brand identity. So goals and outcomes with this really is around how do we how do we get additional pe people to attend these in person develop uh, in person events, give them to exposures to different types of EVs. How does the charge work? How do they charge it? How long does it last? Where they can drive to? Where they can find charging stations? Um, and also for um, addressing that for people that might be in out of uh, area and hard to reach locations. So this provides another mechanism of education and workforce development. Funding, again, required in regards to support and outreach, uh, but we do have the tools and mechanisms and the infrastructure of organizations in place where these things can land. Uh, next steps, again, in terms of implementation um, are really around organizational approach and then organizational oversight. Okay, Ali, next recommendation D. Um, this one's got a unique title to it. It's called Promote an Effective Fair and Transition to EVs. Um, when I first read that, sometimes I tend to think more around the OEM side, and that's not really what this is meant to address. It's really more meant to address those that are in the, in the full EV ecosystem spectrum um, so that their business models can evolve and develop depending on the type of EV transportation that is selected and used. So again, um, that type of community will require a lot of education and workforce development needs. And again, through the educational ecosystems in our industry um, consortiums and organizations, we can continue to support that. Again, this is still all about very much bringing resources together. And we see again, the um, automotive, uh, South Carolina, automotive Council and the South Carolina Energy Office to be a good conduit to support this. 
Um, and we'll just continue to host training sessions and it'll be a living live type of environment uh, for people to access. And recommendation E, which is the last recommendation. Um, really this one just kind of speaks for itself is just really to create an online uh, one-stop type of resource hub um, for all within the ecosystem. And they have that um, re uh, resource hub so how similar to kind of like what the uh, solar system uses with regards to its education awareness around the solar environment. So with that, Allie, I will conclude and turn it over from there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, great. So before we head into our break, uh, is there anything anyone wants to put into space? Anything you want to lift up for the large group? All righty. Um, let's be back in about 10 minutes. So around 2.41. Okay, welcome back. Um, Rad, we can go ahead and advance the slide um, twice actually, so to the next one. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so we are about to break off into breakout groups. We will have about 35 minutes together in our, in our small groups. Um, the purpose of this is to be able to allow space as smaller groups to be able to really talk through some of the substance of these recommendations and questions that you have, elevate any, anything for the energy office that you want to elevate. Um, the, we'll center our conversation around these three questions. Um, so first is around all the rec regarding the recommendations that we just looked at. Um, are there any missing challenges, any missing opportunities? And then part B of that question is, do you see yourself, your organization, um, able to take an active role in implementing any of the recommendations? So second, uh, for the recommendations that included incentives of some kind, uh, where should that money come from? So taxpayers, shareholders, ratepayers, private industry, the owners, or others. We want to be able to. We know that the money is where some is what becomes most contentious sometimes. So we want to be able to have some conversation about that right now. And then third, are there any issues or topics that were not addressed that you would like to suggest for future study or evaluation? So uh, if you, as you look at all the recommendations together, is there anything that stands out as missing at this point? Um, questions before we head into our small groups? All right, uh, Colette, you can send us away. Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, I know our group had a really productive conversation. I hope that you all did too in your groups. Um, so I am going to turn it over to Sarah. Um, but first, just want to offer a huge thank you to you all for your participation today. Um, it's been fantastic to see everybody and to learn from you all and to think through some of this together. So thank you. Um, Sarah, over to you. Thanks, yeah. Allie. Now I'm unmuted. Now I'm unmuted. Um, well, y'all, that was great. Our um, our breakout session was awesome, and I and we took a lot of notes um, on some great insights on both the recommendations that have been presented today, as well as kind of the you know when you put the rubber to the road and how you see those recommendations um, fulfilled. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, and actually I'll get y'all to put the slide back on, Rad. Um, go back to the slide, the Act 46, if we can. Next step, yep, next slide. Nope, other direction. There we go. All right, um, you saw this before, and what I mentioned is what Act 46 has done is created a greater platform for this stakeholder process to inform wise decision-making. Um, we've got the recommendations that have come up and been presented today. They're not in their final form and they're not necessarily all going to be um, put forward, but our job is to rep represent what the stakeholders consent, not all are in consensus either, but our job is to represent what the stakeholders have brought to the table and we will put that together in a report and it will go to the Joint Legislative Committee on the Electrification of Transportation. And um, 
the Act 46 actually also further establishes that after they consider this report that we are to reassemble <clears throat> uh, a stakeholder process, excuse me, every two years thereafter. Uh, and I think it's obvious as we all know here because times are changing and things are changing fast. And as it was said in our working group, you know, even in 2025, things are gonna look very different. And we're gonna need to know and, and make course corrections and adjustments. And hopefully we'll have, have been able to influence some of the recommendations here and, and do them um, in a wise manner. So we'll put together that report. It'll go to the Joint Legislative Committee. They will also consider reports from the Public Service Commission, as well as the Department of Revenue will be making annual reports um, on the um, revenue that's been collected and that's designated for repair and maintenance and improvement of the South Carolina transportation system. And then once the Joint Legislative Committee has all those, that information and studies that, they will then make recommendations to the General Assembly at large to, <clears throat> with the end goal of enabling a fair, efficient, and cost-effective transition to electric transportation. So you can know that as part of the stakeholder process, your involvement is helping to advance that. So where do we go from here before we get to that report? Well, you're not quite done yet. If you are a part of a working group, we continue to, con to be and interact with your working group, probably not as regularly as it has been, um, but we still need your help as we put everything and fine tune it together. If you have not yet been a part of a working group and you're wanting to get more involved, please do so. We'll have an opportunity for that as well. I was looking at chats and got distracted. Is there an answer? Oh, wait, okay. I think so. Sorry. No, I'm good. If there was a question on Act 46. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Also, we're gonna put in the link right now, if it's not already in there in the chat, we're gonna put a link to a questionnaire. Uh, we invite you to participate in that. It's not very long. Um, and we will also be sending it out later via email to everyone that attended. I know some folks have had to drop off. Um, carving out this much time on one afternoon is a great ask. And so we really appreciate everyone who's been here and been able to stick with us through this the questionnaire will add a little bit more into what we went into our breakout sessions. It allows you to also, if there's something you wanted to say, um, or if you have one of those moments that you're washing your hair and all of a sudden you think, I should have said that, or I needed to make this point, this is that opportunity. Um, so you'll get that, in a, it's in the link, as well as you'll get it via email. And finally, it looks like I'm gonna be able to give everybody a gift of about 30 minutes to their afternoon that you didn't know you would have. Uh, before I do that, I just wanna thank everyone sincerely uh, for attending today and being a part of the stakeholder process. Can't have a stakeholder process without stakeholders, um, but you also can't have a stakeholder process without the staff behind the scenes. And so I wanna take a, a moment and just thank all the presenters, all the team leads, and especially the staff at the energy office and Allie and Jen and all the work that they've done and their team um, behind the scenes. This is a, a great group of people to work with, <clears throat> as y'all know, because you've been working with the energy office. Everyone in this office is so approachable um, and really excited and passionate about making wise decisions, especially um, involving energy and electric vehicles. So thank you so much for being a part of today and we will be in touch. Thanks everyone. Thank you.